Good morning. My name's Jeremy Bullock from Centric Software. Um, I rejoice in the rather grand title of data scientist, which basically means I spend most of my time looking at uh, customer data and trying to understand what it's telling us and how we can use it in the virtualization space. Um, I guess I need to explain, first of all, what it is we do. Uh, we have uh, really two parts to the company. One is um, deep customer understanding, and the second part, which Aaron is going to cover later on in the session, is, uh, is about a universal workspace, uh, enabling people to access applications across the web, the cloud, their local device, all from a single instance, uh, uh, an interface. But what we do on the IQ side, which is my speciality, is we let loose an agent that downloads onto client machines. The agent starts to collect information. It collects straightforward inventory information about the devices themselves. It, create, it, it, it collects application information, inventory information for the application. And it collects usage information from the user. And at its lowest level, or perhaps highest level of granularity, the sort of information we're collecting goes a bit like this. Every time a user interacts with an application, we collect the username, the machine name, the application name, the document that they're interacting with, the address that that document is held in, the means that they're getting to that document, the resources which are used, the read, write, and other IOPS, read, write, other data traffic, GDI, memory, CPU, all of that resource information. So we're collecting that at every instance that a user interacts with an application. So we can see, for example, at a very, very low level, the, the way in which they interact across different applications. So if they open up Outlook, then go to Excel, then go to some corporate application, we can see that flow through the data. Now, why is that important? It's important because it starts to give us a real understanding of what that user is, what that enterprise does, the way in which they do it, the interactions between different um, departments, different areas, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm going to do this morning is just to show you something which um, we actually launched a couple of months ago. It's called the uh, Workspace Designer for, Centric, for Citrix, rather. Um, and it's a means of getting quickly through all of the information that you might need to either um, produce a business case and an outline scaling for a Citrix solution, or indeed to help you with the architecture piece of that. Now, the analogy I use, and I'm going to, what I'm going to do is to step into a real-life customer database, is that it's a bit like being uh, an archaeologist, this particular game, and specifically a paleontologist. So what we've got here is we've come across a great big burial mound. And in, the, in this burial mound, in the data that I'm going to show you today, there are around about 5,500 users. There are around about 3,500 machines. There are 25 million shards of pottery that said, this person used this machine and this application on this date for this length of time, and something of the order of 1,400 applications. And what we need to do is to start to put some order around this, to create some sense around the whole thing. And I guess most of you are familiar with the, uh, the Citrix work cases, the use cases, very similar to Microsoft's, very similar to um, VMware's, but effectively, it's that first exercise is all about segmentation. How do you start to segment your users? So what I'm going to do this morning is to show you how it is we go about segmenting the user base, or how our customers go, go about segmenting the user base through the use of our tool. So you have to bear with me here. It's been loaded onto five and a half, uh, sorry, three and a half thousand devices. We've had five and a half thousand users using their devices for a couple of months, and we built up a picture of what those users are doing and how they're doing it. But before we can get any sense out of this, we really need to make a number of decisions. So I'm going to go into hardware inventory, first of all. And you'll see over here on the right-hand side, for classify, we've got what um, Citrix use cases, the task worker, the knowledge worker, the secure worker, and the road warrior. And what we're asking here is to say, OK, let's just start the ball rolling here. If someone's using a particular type of device, let's say a, um, a portable device, and it's shown here in the, uh, in the chassis type, 
then we can allocate that to a particular use group. And in this case, we'd allocate it to the road warrior. So we're saying that anyone who's a road warrior is using a chassis of the type portable or laptop. Now at this stage, all we're looking at is the device. And we'll come on to applications and other things a little later on. But in the first instance, what we're saying here is these are good indicators of road warriors. As we move across, we can go look at USB devices. And again, if we take Secure Worker, we'll see here that a good indicator of someone who needs a level of security in this organization is whether they've got this Aladdin USB key or the Aladdin Hasp key. So we've, we've made those decisions, the enterprise has made those decisions, saying, I know enough about my organization to be able to say these are things that, that are indicators of secure workers it, from a physical perspective. And the same hold true for knowledge workers. Maybe it's a particular device, particular device type. Um, and what's left at the end are all of the task workers. Are you all with me so far? Yeah? OK. So we can go across and we can make these decisions. I won't, uh, I won't go into that in too much further detail. I'm going to go now into software inventory side. And I'm, not, I'm going here really just to, 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 to show you the way in which our software works, which is somewhat different from, from others. The first thing to say is we do not have a data dictionary. There is no data dictionary. We use proprietary algorithms to match what's installed and what gets executed. As those of you who have ever been in this spreadsheet hell probably know that most tools will tell you what executables get used. So you'll know that Excel.exe is used, but you know, won't know whether that was installed as part of a package, whether it's part of Office, whether it was standalone, and that takes you into quite a wor world of hell in terms of trying to certainly drive out software asset rationalization benefits. So as I say, because we don't use a data dictionary, we're able to identify, for example, a00893 underscore video LAN underscore VLC player. This particular client, every time they deploy a piece of software centrally through their software deployment tools, they rename it, which is useful because we can always, always see from the, the title of the software application whether it's been centrally installed or locally installed. But for um, products that require a data dictionary, unless they've been to this specific client and have already logged in, all of those naming conventions, they're just not going to get matched across. So that would be the, the first thing I'd say there. The second thing is, what we try and do is, is to have some concept of um, applications that maybe aren't applications in the traditional sense. So unless, for example, um, we had installed our agent on these um, network locations, then we'd never find out which those, these applications were. Well, what we do is we look for shortcuts and properly formed shortcuts in both the start menu and on the desktop. And we look for evidence of applications that exist somewhere else, either on the web or on the network or on somewhere, some other disk drive. And we start to treat these as real applications even though they might be living somewhere else. Now, we don't pick up any inventory for this, because unless we're on the devices, we can't actually count them. But we can see the application, and we can see that people are using it. Are using it. The same holds true for anything which is web-like. So here we're seeing whatever this is. Please review website. Never heard of it, but it's a please review website. Someone somewhere thinks it's of value, and so we can, we can see what that is. But you get, the, you get the idea here. So this is all about separating out the wheat from the chaff. If I go to application usage now, so in the same way as when we were looking at devices and saying, what clues does this device give us about the way in which the user interacts with their enterprise estate? So we can do the same here. So we can start to say, OK, well, what's an indicator of VPN software? Well, anyone who uses Serco, this, these two Cisco, Cisco uh, systems pieces of software, is evidence for this particular organization that they're using VPN. Now, when you combine that with the information about mobile devices, 
you start to get the, the position where you can differentiate between road warriors, people who are actually out on the road and using the mobile devices in the way in which they're supposed to be used, and what we call static mobile workers. These are typically users whose the furthest their, desk, their, their laptop ever goes is from the top of the desk to the bottom drawer each night. Now, typically, these could well be road warriors who've been promoted. They no longer get out and about anymore. They now sit in the offices. So these could be status symbols. But what you're starting to do here is to use the data that you're collecting to start to make some inferences about the users that are, who are using this enterprise. The same holds true with secure systems. So we can identify, for example, this um, M or secure browser as something which people who are known as secure workers regularly use. So that, combined with the Aladdin Hasp key, starts to give us some correlation. We're focusing in now on a group of people that we think are secure workers. We can identify the road warriors, the static mobile workers, and now the secure workers. And we can do the same thing with knowledge software. So if we thought that, for example, AutoCAD was something which was specific to a knowledge worker, we can start to flag up those pieces of software. And all we're doing is we're just creating linkages, effectively, between our use types and the, the markers, the things that might tell us what it is that they do, where they fit into the organization. And you'll see here on the right-hand side that we, we give you the number of users. And if I uh, just quickly set a filter for this, so Sophos Auto Update, most popular application, but watch this at the, the right-hand side, the, um, the scroll button here. So I'm going to go down. There we go. I've gone hardly any distance at all, and we're looking at numbers of users in the sub-tens. Still hardly going anywhere. There we go. We're in the ones now. Let's just calibrate that. So you get some idea there of the level of usage. We've not gone very far before we're getting ones. And if I go a bit further down, we're seeing zeros crop up fairly quickly. So if that's, and we'll come to this later, if, that, if this is the size of your application estate, this is the amount of those applications that are actually used. And we're looking there at what, a fifth? in terms of the number. Now, at this stage, you know, we're, we're not version agnostic or anything like that, so it's, uh, and we're at application level rather than package level, so it's not, it's not an entirely accurate picture, but it, it gives you a flavor for it, and we'll come to that uh, a bit later. Um, the other thing that we allow the client to do is to load in their own information for both users and for devices. Typically, what we find is that although we collect um, AD information in the application, most of our clients tell us that AD is the least reliable of their data sources. They much prefer to go to um, asset inventories for devices. They much prefer to go to HR systems, payroll systems, etc., for people and where they, where they work. And the power of this now is the way in which you start to combine organizational information alongside the uh, the data that you're collecting, the machine and the user and the application data. So you can start to say, for example, this part of the organization uses these applications. These, you, you can start to segment at that level if you so require. And the way in which our import is done is you can import anything at all. As long as you do the username, the business that they work in, the organization that they work in, and their physical location, then anything else. You can go right the way down to their height, their date of birth, cost codes, specialisms, anything you want. And we give you the ability later on to be able to sort based on things which are of importance to your organization. So at this stage, what we've done is we've just started to do some basic cataloging of the data that we've got. And we're now going to go into effectively the next stage, which is the transform piece. I'm going to go down to workspace designer for Citrix because it takes us, it's a good journey through the capabilities of the software. As I said at the beginning, what we're trying to do here is, is to really do two things. One is to give people a notion of the scale of the prize, the opportunity. It's not a business case at this stage. It's just an opportunity. Is this worth pursuing? And if, if so, what sort of scale of reward might you get from that? 
First thing we can see at the top is application savings. Now, you know, I'll put my hand up and say application savings, by and large, is fairly soft. It all depends on so many parameters in a large enterprise. Where are they up to with their um, enterprise agreements with Microsoft and other suppliers? When are their renewal dates? Can they back out from things? Can these, can these really be turned into hard savings? However, if nothing else, what it shows is the value of the software pool that you have in the organization. Software which could be reused, could be recycled. Maintenance savings, possibly a little more, um, a little more tangible. Assuming that IT is actually maintaining everything, which of course is a fairly big, big assumption because lots of it is loaded by uh, terrorists within the organization. Um, there is an opportunity for some maintenance savings in there. Again, it's the delta between what's installed and what gets used. Very, very simple. We're not, we're not trying to put ourselves forward as a software asset management company here. This is all about just building your way through the data and getting some idea of the scale of the prize. This third one, though, um, is particularly relevant in a virtualization world. The one thing that virtualization gives you, which is a real benefit, is hot desking. You're removing the connection between a physical desk and the person who works at that desk. And what we find is that organizations with large um, premises portfolios, whether it's one building or several buildings, offer enormous scope for potential savings. And if you think about the device, as um, the computer with our agent on as a clocking in device. We know where users go, which machines they use, and if we've got a location for both the user and the machine, effectively we're seeing the way the users use the space in their organization. And what we find is that in the same way as applications are underutilized, so is space. In a world where the desk is tied to the device and the user's tied to the device, what you find typically is that there is around about 15 to 20% of free space available in an organization. If you think about this, it's not, it's not particularly su surprising because when you scale your organization, you're going to scale it for, to take into account people's holidays, their sickness, et cetera, et cetera. So typically, large organizations tend to have 15 to 20% more people than they actually need. They still need those people because they have to cover for holiday and sickness, et cetera. But when you decouple the desktop from the physical location, that space starts to become available. And this is a real hard saving. So this is, it either represents one of two things. It represents one of three things. One is that if the, if the company is growing or is, is squeezed for space and is looking to acquire new premises, they may not have to. If they're growing and they don't have the space, then they may not need to do it. And if they're contracting or stable and they've got too much space, then they've got the opportunity to get rid of that. So this represents potentially a real hard saving and one that is delivered to the business by IT. It's a really valuable thing. It's really tangible to business owners in a way that perhaps you know, application rationalization isn't. Are you with me on this? I want to challenge me. Feel free. So overall, total opportunity for this particular client around about 5.3 million pounds in this instance. So I guess six and a bit million dollars um, in the US. And effectively what, what we're trying to do here is we're saying it's worthwhile to, to go to the next step. It's worthwhile to go and look at your virtualization opportunity here because there's a big prize to be had. Now the question is, can we then deliver the information that enables you to work out what the costs are associated with virtualization so that you can look at the, the rounding of the business case? If there's this much benefit, how much is my cost likely to be? So we start off with some decisions around architecture. So what we've done here, we've taken our five and a half thousand users and we've used those triangulation points that I spoke about earlier to determine how many of our users, in this case 3,224, fall into the category of shared workstations. And that's all of them. So 3,224 people in this organization regularly share workstations. We know that that's effectively our mobile workforce within the company itself. It could be call center work, it could be anything at all. This happens to be. Um, 
So 24-7, three shifts, lots of sharing. We also have got 640 users down here who are security enabled and also road warriors. <coughs> no real surprise there. We're sending out our devices on the road. The guys who've got the mobile devices have also got enhanced <coughs> levels of security. We've also got, though, this group here of 517 who are static mobile users. And what does that mean? These are guys who've never used VPN and who we've never seen access any application in a disconnected state. So every time we take that measurement that I spoke about right at the outset, we also look for one other thing, which is how are they connected? Are they not connected to anything at all? Are they connected just to the internet or are they connected to their intranet or both? both intranet and internet. Because what we can see from that is, again, more information about the possibilities in terms of application delivery. If someone, every time they interact with their enterprise, with their mobile, devi mobile device, they've always got the internet on, then we know we can deliver applications in one way. If we see significant amounts of use where they're never connected to anything but their mobile, we're restricted to a different set. So this is all just starting to build up a picture. And effectively, what we've done here is we've taken our 5,500 users and our 3,500 devices, and we've now started to build out use cases. So we know who the task workers are. We know who the shared workstation users are, the secure road warriors, the static road warriors, the knowledge workers. We've got the lot. And what you see down here at the bottom is for each of these categories, we're saying here is a list of in this case for Citrix, but you know, it could be for anything else. Here are a list of the Flexcast options that are available to that particular group. So for the shared workstation, you can have hosted VDI, on-demand applications, and streamed VHD. And it's defaulting to a recommendation, which is the uh, on-demand application. And here we're going across to the Citrix website and just pumping up some collateral from them. And if I go to, let's take the secure road warriors, we can see that they can have a local, local VM or on-demand applications, and we're defaulting it to local VM. But here's the opportunity for you as the architect to make some decisions. They've got to be sensible decisions. We're only going to let you make decisions which are relevant to that particular group. But you can start to make those decisions yourself, and you can start to work out the solution. Where we're going to go to next is um, this I do largely for demonstrations, so you're just going to have to bear with me for a second, 1140 packages are installed across the estate. And our definition of a package is all of the applications that go into a particular package itself. So Microsoft Office Professional 2007 would be a package, but it would have six discrete applications underneath that. So this is just the number of packages that are installed. And if I go to used packages, which takes a little while to get, because I'm actually running this on a live database on my laptop. Um, is we see that of the 1140 packages that are installed, only 434 of those, and at this point we are looking at versions as well, are actually used. So a significant number of the installed application, uh, installed package base is not used within this organization. And now I'm going to just go down here. I should have reset that. Excuse me a second. OK. Um, because of the resolution on here, I apologize in advance. I'll see if I can just squeeze that across a second, and maybe break it out a little further. There we go. What this is telling us, this is showing the, what we call the long tail of applications. So the blue line represents the percentage of users who use applications 1 to 358 on the right-hand side. So now we've, we've gone version agnostic. So Office is Office is Office, Excel is Excel is Excel. We're not interested anymore at this stage at the versioning or anything else. This is not about licensing. This is about demand, the demand that's going to be put on your infrastructure. And so what we see here is this blue line, 100% of users or thereabouts use application number one, which is shown over here, Internet Explorer. Of the order, I guess, of 95% of users use application two, which is Word. And so you can see very quickly here that the, the tail really starts at around about 40-odd applications. And at that point, we're now hitting less and less and less of our user base. And as we go across to the right-hand side, you know, these are all onesies and twosies. So the advantage with this, what this is trying to do, 
is to give you the ability, I'll squeeze it up on that side, to say, OK, let's, let's start to play around with the numbers here. Anything which generates more than, let's say, 10,000 sessions or is used by more than 10 people, let's see what that looks like. So there we go. Now our tail has gone from 358 down to 92. You can still see the cutoff, but you, know, you can see it in a bit more detail now. It's around about 40, between the 40 to 50 applications is where it starts to, to fold away for this particular organization. So what we're now doing, we, we're building up effectively our master build, our base build. These are the applications. If we do all of these, then we'll fulfill most of our users' application requirements. And I can go in here, I can deselect things that, um, that perhaps I want to strip out from the operating system. Um, so if I go to my discards pile over here, things like Vulscan, um, whatever that is, Alm Mod, Alm Detect, Flash, you know, I'm just playing around with this stuff. But you, you understand where I'm going with this. Effectively, we're separating out those things which a lot of people use a lot of the time from those things, the application tail, which are used by what have I done there? relatively few people. And we can look at different delivery mechanisms for those applications. <clears throat> so effectively, what we've got when we go through this is our shopping list now for our application compatibility discovery. What we don't want to do is just send out a big list to our um, application compatibility partners. What we want to do is to focus in on those applications that are going to make a difference and which we can deal with quickly. So a right click, export, oops, right click, export to CSV, off it goes. Now you have to, you have to sort of bear with me here because time passes and the application discovery piece is done. In this case, we've had AppDNA do it. And all of those MHT files, CSV files, et cetera, are now sitting somewhere in the system. And we ask that the user points to where those CSV and MHT files are sitting, because then we can get to this. So we're pulling in from AppDNA, mapped against all of the um, applications which we've discovered and linked across the red, amber, green state status for, um, 60, uh, for server, 2010, 64-bit, ZenApp, Win7, AppV, et cetera, et cetera. And the user can go through here. You can ignore things. So Roxio Easy CD Creator in this particular client is part of their base build, and it's part of their startup. So actually, we see lots of usage, apparently, of Roxio Easy CD Creator. In actual fact, all we're seeing is when people boot up each day, that script is getting run. So we've separated out who actually uses it from who doesn't, and so we've excluded it, ignored it now from our equation, which is good because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of red stuff in there. And if I click on that particular one, I can see my AppDNA MHT report for that. I can find out exactly why it's a troublesome application. This is coming directly from their product. Um, I can see what the remediation um, issues are if they're there. And go to Adobe Acrobat, nice green one. I can look at Windows 7 and see exactly the way that's put together. So this is really showing how we can um, mix it up with other people's um, inputs here. So change base, app DNA, um, or you know, for those clients who just want to do a rough and ready in the first place, you can change these manually. You don't have to invest in the compatibility at this stage. It def everything defaults out of the box to green. The assumption is you can do everything. And then you can go in and you can start to play around with it. And the reason that's important is, um, and I'll come to uh, this one, because this really sort of outlines to, uh, outlines to me the, the importance of understanding usage. The importance of understanding usage really is twofold in this space. First of all, you don't want to spend money on an app DNA or a change-based license for an application that's only used by a few people and which is probably not high up on your list. Second thing is, when you've done your compatibility, how do you know which things you need to do first? So what we've done here is we've built some algorithms that say, OK, of the 5,500 users that you've got, and based on your, in this case, app DNA um, compatibility testing, there are 75 users who don't need anything done whatsoever. Out of the box, you could virtualize those 75. 
Not a lot out of 5,500. So then we look at the next level, and we can see that, okay, if you do A00743, Adobe Acrobat Reader 812, then you can pull in another 1,820 users, and that's all you need to do. So first application, get that one done. Then we see there's a group of 1,407 who, if we do Adobe Acrobat Reader 812, which we've done with the previous group, and Open Text Live Link Explorer, we pick up another 1,400. So you can see that with two applications remediated, we've already got, what's that, 3,200 3, or so of our users just by doing two applications. And surprise, surprise, well, you won't be surprised by now, but you know, as we go down, the law of diminishing marginal returns kicks in, and we can see that down here, you know, we're only picking off three users, two users, one user, one man and his dog spot, bottle of pop, sausage roll, blah, blah, blah. You see where I'm going with this. This is all about, um, in banking, it used to be called amount consciousness. It's all about making sure that we get the maximum bangs per buck and that we can implement this stuff really quickly. That we don't get held up by the tail. That we can sort our way through the intellectual problem of what do we do, when do we do it, how do we do it, which groups are affected, just by using the data here. Just by using the data. Fairly simple stuff. Um, so, okay, we've gone through that. Let's, this is what the solution starts to look like. Um, oops. This is my fault. Our product doesn't have this in, but you're looking at my um, play deck. This is, I think it's from Brian Madden's site. So this is the importance of strategic design. How do you stop a VDI... Let's just open that up. It's, how do you stop a VDI deployment in its tracks scale up? And the point that Brian's making here is that most early implementations of VDI are done against pilots. They're done against a very small set of users. They're done without any great thought as to the strategic direction that you're going to take. And it becomes very, very difficult to build it out at scale. Yeah, of course, what are your users want? They're saying, this is successful. It won't cost us a lot more money. Let's just build it out. It's really easy. But we all know what's hap what happens then. We just don't take into account the implications of that, and it starts to fall to pieces. So the idea here is that whatever you do, whether you do it for one little department or a business division or the whole business at once, is that you do it with an eye to the future, to where it is you're going to go. Because that way you'll learn a lot along the way. And secondly, you should get a consistent user experience as you go, th as you go through. So we're saying here are our use cases. And excuse the, the red and the blue. This is, again, as I say, I've been mucking around with this and I've managed to break something somewhere. But you can see the breakdown between the different use cases. And here is the, the breakdown between the different solutions. So the biggest solution of all, on-demand apps, 3,228 users, followed by local VM, hosted VDI, and hosted shared. And for each of those, we can look at the detail. So for example, we can look at, I would be able to. I've managed to break that somehow. Let's just. I've managed to break the whole thing. Well, that's not good, is it? <laughs> Never work with children, animals, or computers. Excuse me, whilst I'm embarrassed. Okay, you might just have to bear with me on this. Okay, what well, this should be showing you ah, is um, for each of these solutions, so the hosted shared solution, all of the users for that solution, all of the applications that they use for that solution, and then the template. And what do I, what do I mean by template? So this is the, the groupings of specific applications that people use. So a group of 15 people who use the same groups of applications as they go through, as opposed to the next group of 14 or whatever it is that use a slightly different set of applications. I do apologize for this. I don't, um, I don't quite know what I've done. I had to uninstall it from my machine yesterday whilst I was working on something else. And I do appear to have managed to break it. So apologies. Um, This next element, oh, this is really going to be interesting. This would, this would look at the long tail again. 
but for each specific um, set of applications. This would look at the session and image concurrency for each of these. And if, if it was working, what I'd be able to show you here is the interesting point for the on-demand applications, that if you look at this, the number of sessions that you need to manage is around about 7,500 concurrent sessions. The number of images is just under 900. So this particular group, were we to go down an image-based route, could be serviced by sub-1,000 images. Again, this, this sizing information is very, very um, critical in terms of understanding what, you, what, you'd, uh, what you'd provision for people. Now, for some reason, this seems to be working. <laughs> so if I um, switch, just to show it is working, from one to another, then what we're seeing here is based on all of the decisions that we've made so far. So for this group of users, for the applications that we've selected, we're looking at what is the peak memory requirement in gigabytes for that particular group. So for that 647, uh, let's do on-demand apps rather than local VM. It's a bit more meaningful in this particular context. <clears throat> So for that 3,228 users, bear in mind that in terms of concurrency, we're managing 7,000 or so sessions. We're looking at a state memory across the piece of just under 1,300 gigabytes across the uh, estate for those applications. So this, is not, this doesn't include the operating system. This is just the applications. And we're observing this from the data that we picked up from their fat clients. So we're modeling across, effectively, from one to the other. Ditto for read and write and other IOPS, and also for the login profile, so that we know that at any one time, the maximum number of logins that we're going to have to manage per minute for this group is 16. So we've known, because we're looking throughout the days at how many people are logging in concurrently, we know we've only got to manage 16 users there. You have to excuse me. So at this level, um, what we're starting to look at now is, is what is it that drives resource usage? So if you think about this for a moment, I'll, what I'll do is I'll jump across to a spreadsheet because I can illustrate what I can't show on the screen now from the, from the spreadsheet, uh, from the um, PowerPoint deck. So this is, this is this particular customer again, 17th of January 2012. And what we're looking at here is the peak memory in gigabytes for the various applications that, that are being used. So we can see Internet Explorer here at the bottom, followed by Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft Office Word, IS Info, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the modeled memory profile of model concurrent memory profile for all of those users using these applications which we've selected to go into our master build. And we can look at the GDI elements of that as well. And you see, you know, it's um, over on the left-hand side here, shift operation. So, we're, you know, if you screw your eyes up, it still looks the same. But the bulk of people are coming in in the morning, working their way throughout the day, going home in the evening, and then the, the shift's coming in again. But a very similar picture, if I toggle... Um, backwards and forwards between memory and GDI, you'll see that you know, the picture's not particularly different. Same sort of trends. Then when I look at um, read and write IOPS, we're still seeing the same vague picture, but it's a lot more spiky. And why is it a lot more spiky? They're using the same applications, but the big difference is they're all using different content in those applications. And it's content that tends to drive the IOPS figure. It doesn't drive memory or GDI or CPU in the same way that it drives IOPS. And now if we look at the same estate a couple of days later, we can see again you know, the memory in terms of uh, gigabytes, the GDI, very, very similar. If I toggle backwards and forwards between those, very similar picture. But then I go to IOPS for this particular day and we see an enormous great spike and the question, obviously, is, well, what's caused that? It's Adobe Acrobat Reader that's caused the spike. Now, on any other measure, if we were looking at 
um, RIOPS and had set a benchmark value for this, we'd probably be saying that Adobe Acrobat Reader is a problem application. Now, we all know that Adobe Acrobat Reader, by and large, isn't a prob problem application. So what's caused this? Well, because we go down to such a low level of detail, we know what caused this. And it, what it is is uh, uh, a near-miss incident in airspace, which results in a document called a 1394.pdf being created. And this PDF has got, typically, plots taken from the radar, so they can see exactly how things are. There might be four or five plots from the radar, maybe a photograph of the plane on the ground to identify it, or the planes on the ground to identify it, all bundled up into a 1394.pdf document. And you'd appreciate that a, 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 a potential collision in mid-air mid is quite an important event. So a lot of people want to know about this. And so this PDF is sent via email to around about 250 people. And you just think about this for a second. You know, you've got this 1394.pdf situation has just arrived in your inbox. You're one of the 200 people. You've been sent it for some reason. What's the first thing you're going to do? As soon as you see it arrive there, you're going to open it up. So what we see here is around about 200 people opening up a content-rich PDF file at the same time, which was delivered via email. Now, you know, no big deal in a fat world, because all it does is put a little bit more extra load onto your local machine. But in a, in a world where you're starting to share those resources out, what would be the impact of this? And we've nearly doubled the estate RIOPS at that particular instance. And typically, according to my good friend Jim Moyle, what happens is that this just slows the whole thing down. That load is then spread across the whole estate. People will start to see slow reaction times for different applications, for Excel, for PowerPoint. You know, your help desk is going to start to get inundated with, with, with requests saying that this application is running slowly. Big problem, big problem. But if you understand it, what you can start to do is to change the way that the business operates itself, the way in which the business disseminates this information. They can start to use choices that, um, that mitigate for that. <coughs> So I apologies for, um, for not being able to show you that actually in the interface, but such is life, such is life. So the point at this level then, so when we've got to the end, we know what causes the problems. We know the sizing. We know which users are going to take which solutions. We know which applications we've got to deploy to those users. We know how we're going to deploy those to those users. Just that my poor interface just won't show it which I apologize again. Um, <clears throat> so that's the workspace designer for, for Citrix. The other aspect to the tool, and this is all mediated through the uh, user interface, is something which we call the um, IT practitioner's report. And the IT practitioner's report is effectively a, a dump of data into a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's fairly highly controlled. If I just um, change my view here, headings, and I'll go full screen, is, and to make it a bit smaller, there's my sizing. No, I can't do that. Each one of these effectively is a, is a link. We can look at the endpoint devices. So this is as much detail as you probably want to know about a device the device name, its chassis type, classification, whether it's structured or unstructured, manufacturer model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much everything that um, an IT practitioner might want in order to be able to uh, start producing reports uh, for themselves rather than go through the, uh, the interface. Um, I'm going to throw it open to you guys now. Do you have any questions for me? Anything you'd like me to ramble on about a bit more? No? I just have one question on your resume rank before 7 at DNA. Yep. So you're doing some kind of dependency analysis also in the background? How do you mean?
what, what we do, we have had requests for this. We don't, we don't have it in the interface at the moment. What we collect at each one of those um, granular levels is the parent and the child process ID. So there is the ability to link the whole thing back together again. I guess that's, that's what you're teasing at, isn't it? Yep. 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 Gotcha. I mean, I, I, I guess to, to answer your question, then we, we we could help with that in in a couple of ways. One is that. Uh, I don't know whether I can show this in. Um... The record portion was primarily about accessibility to 64 bit, Windows 7, uh, you know, um, uh, application compatible and game based solutions, those kind of things, things they can extract. Yep. They really don't say much about dependency. No, they don't. No, they don't. I think where, 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 we, where we can certainly help with that is, is this, which I wasn't able to show you in the um, workspace design for, for Citrix, but I can show you here for, um, is if we look at this group of users here, this group of 31, effectively what we're looking at here across the top, uh, at a version agnostic level, are all of the applications that that group uses. So, effect, so to, let's just take, you know, say it's application X that we're thinking of changing. What we can do is we can look for all of the groups who use application X and all of the applications that they use alongside X. So let's just say for the sake of example here in this group of 31 that it was Excel that we were interested in. That was the thing we were going to change. We know from this that the other applications which they use are Internet Explorer, Outlook, WinWord, Acrobat, uh, can't even read that, whatever it is, and Passport, and that's it. That's, they're, they're, that's the group of applications that those 31 users use. And what we could then do is we can go into those, that 31 and start to look at the parent-child relationships between them. So they start to see them. So even if it was a situation where actually these applications aren't, strictly speaking, linked, but the way in which the people do their job is they have to use this application, then perhaps they use a terminal, em terminal emulator, do some cut and paste between the two. What we'd be able to do is to say, okay, here, here are the applications which are used alongside this particular one. So it's, I mean, it's sort of answering your question in a roundabout way. So yes, we could help with that. Could we identify those? In some instances, yes, where there's a relationship between the parent and child process ID, but in other instances, we'd just be able to show you what gets used together. And if we drop down into the detailed data, so once we've established this is a group of people that we're interested in, we could actually look at the workflows of what they do. So we could actually see, okay, they open up Excel, then they go into Hummingbird Exceed, they come back, they do something else with Excel, they shut it down, then they open it up again. So you could actually start to analyze their workflows in terms of that stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I think you have more of the data there. It's kind of important now. Exactly. And, and uh, I, you know, as a, as a sort of relatively new company, we're always looking for ways in which we can uh, surface information that is of value and, and do it in such a way that it takes strain away from organizations like, uh, like your own. Anyone else? OK. Aaron, yes, sir. you're going to do your universal thing? So I'm Aaron Joe. I do work for Centric Software. And thank you. Apparently, I've got to switch mics. Hold on a second. So, what Jeremy was talking about is the analytics behind what your end users are doing. Why, or what applications they're using, how often they're using them. Uh, where they're using them from, whether it be within the four walls of your office or the off-site. Now, what we're trying to do with Universal is that application tail that Jeremy was talking about, 
that that first part, the, the 90-ish percent of your users are going to be part of your gold bill, your base build. Everything else, well, we may not want to put that in the base bill. We don't want to spend time trying to figure out do these uh, end users really need to be part of this end, uh, base build? Do my IT guys have to really take care of these and take care of the maintenance behind all those applications? So we can have other ways of uh, delivering these applications to those end users. And that's where Universal comes into play. It's a central web page that uh, will be sitting internally that will uh, allow your end users to log in and get those applications. Now, what we do with the background is whether you deliver them through Citrix, whether you deliver them through VMware, Microsoft, it doesn't matter to us. So now your end users don't have to go to three, four, five different web pages to get all of these applications. They just come to here, and now there's this central uh, single pane of glass, if you will, I hate using that term, but essentially that's what it is. The single pane of glass where your end users can go to get all of their applications. Other ways we can help out with this too is we can reduce a lot of your uh, help desk phone calls uh, simply because we have a forget password here. How many people or how many of your calls are going to be because they f your end users forgot their passwords? Especially when you have five different passwords to remember for your end users. So that can definitely help you out as well. So if we log in here. Apologies for the slow internet. So when you first log in, you can see that you have to register a new device. So this way, this is going to tie back into the Workspace IQ and tell you, all right, here's my mobile workers. Here's my static workers. So I'm just going to call this laptop for now. So you can see on this main page here, on the dashboard, the user dashboard, we have a couple of quick links. Uh, we have this banner here, which obviously you guys can customize to make it look however you want it. We have uh, the recently used resources. So do they use Excel last? they use PowerPoint last? Uh, we also have a notice board, which is customizable to different locations. So if you're a global organization, if you want to send a message to, let's say, your US office or your Asia offices, you can do that uh, through the notice board. And it only send to that specific location. Now, this is helpful instead of trying to send, uh, as Jeremy was saying, the, the emails through, uh, a notice through emails, you can have them log in. Because when they log in every day to get these applications, they'll see it right here, right on the main page. And these things, uh, these modules are uh, customizable. You can move them around. You can resize them. Kind of so your end users can kind of make this page look however they want it to look like. So if you go into the applications, you see a list of the approved applications that your end users can use. Uh, so right now, uh, I have access to the Windows 7 desktop, Salesforce, Twitter. Uh, that's another thing, too, is SaaS applications can be delivered through here. So when the biggest problem that a lot of people are having is that when you're using a SaaS application like Salesforce.com, uh, if you're, uh, when that end user leaves, they still have access to the username, the password, unless you go ahead and remove those credentials from them as soon as they leave. They, they'll still have access to them, so they can still download that data and take it to their next company. That poses a real problem in the sense that that's all sensitive information. You don't want them to leave with that information. So what we can do is we can tie all that in to Universal so that all they have to do is click on Salesforce.com, uh, the Salesforce icon. And so now they never see the username, they never see the password. All they know is I, gotta, I can click on Salesforce and I'll get everything that my company is going to be able to show me. So when they do go to leave, you don't have to worry about them taking the information with them. Something else that's helpful too is they can go ahead and request applications. So they, for example, say, okay, I don't have Word here. I'm going to need Word. So you can come into the catalog and just like a storefront, just like uh, the App Store, if you will, 
you can go in and say, all right, I want, for whatever reason, I want WordPad. So you can come in and say, all right, click, click on this plus sign. Uh, it's going to send an email off to you guys, the, the IT, uh, and say, all right, user X has requested WordPad. Do you want to approve it, yes or no? And it's really simple. I just go into the administration, and there will be a list of users with what they wanted uh, in terms of the applications. I'm sorry? What do you mean? So if you have a set of users and they're using the applications that are expensive, you don't want everybody in your environment using this. You need to entitle them to entitle them to an active directory. So you say everybody that does first trading that has access needs to get the application. So they entitle them to the what you can do in the background is say, all right, uh, HR, for example, gets a list of all the HR uh, applications. And then would they only see those applications that are entitled to as opposed to everything else? Oh, in, in this page right here? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so they're not going to see uh, AD domains and, and users groups. Yes, sir? Uh, not at this time, no. So one of the other things that we can do is if we go back to the applications list, there are different policies that we can set up in place. So if you're within the four walls of your uh, organization, uh, you may want them to get the application via the local machine. And so the, what we can do, we can set up the policy so that if they're on network, for example, let's say if they request PowerPoint, it's going to get open up the PowerPoint that's installed on the local machine. If they're sitting in Starbucks down the street somewhere, maybe you don't want them to install, uh, open up from the local machine. Instead, you want them to stream it from uh, Universal. That way, they can't do uh, screen scrapes and, and things of the sort so that they can save it onto the local machine. Yes. Yep. That's what I was going to ask, the document, sure. So instead of having all your end users hold everything in, on their local machines, the, the documents, if they email, if they want to work on it from home, they either email it out, they put it on the USB key. Well, with Universal, what you can do is you can share those documents. So in, in this way, everything gets housed and held internally. So again, when they go to leave the company, they don't have these uh, documents sitting on their, U their personal USB keys, their personal laptops, and so they all stay within the company. What they can also do is you can favorite these, and kind of like pinnings. So you can say, all right, every time I come into this particular uh, page, the document page, I want to be able to see this document, because um, that's what I work on the most. If we expand that home drive, we can look at different uh, drives that the end users are using and the different documents that they have in there as well. Now, from an IT's perspective, the only agents that we need to deploy for this particular application, Centrix uh, Universal, are what you're using in the background. So if you have a Citrix backend, then all you need is a Citrix receiver. VMware, Microsoft, same thing. There's no special agent that's required for uh, the Citrix, uh, Centrix Universal. Uh, in terms of web browsers, we haven't had any 
compatibility issues. They've been working on uh, all the major ones, so IE, Firefox, Chrome. As you can see, this is running in Chrome right now. And in terms of administration, if we go to the policy, let me just show you that real quick. Uh, Space Universal. The workspace content rules. This is where you're going to go, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier, to set up <coughs> set up those policies. So, if they're on-prem, off-prem, uh, how you want those applications delivered. See, there's a lot of different ways of being able to do it. Now, I'm logged in as the administrator, so I can see everything. Really, that much to it. I mean, does anyone have any questions? I want to keep this interactive. So, yes, sir. The location. So, for the notifications. Oh, oh, oh. So that's. That's where we tie back into the workspace IQ. The, the, the agent is going to figure out uh, where you are in, in terms uh, of the location. We're going to see uh, what your IP address is, the machine name, the local networks, things like that. That's where we're going to tie everything together.